Well, Heather, thanks so much for taking some time to hang with me today. I appreciate it. Yes, thanks for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Tell me a little bit about your journey with anxiety. I didn't know I was an anxious person until about 12 years ago. And then somebody told me I was a doctor. After looking at my brain, I was like, oh, I didn't know. I thought everybody felt like I felt. And they're like, no, not everybody feels this way. I'm like, oh, well, okay. I must be special. So it sounds like you're special too, Heather. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we are special. Yeah, you sound a lot like I uh, sounded. I didn't know that I had anxiety. I had no idea. I thought that anxiety looked a certain way. I'm not even sure what I thought. I probably thought that meant someone was having a lot of panic attacks and, you know, was not able to like go out of the house often. I'm not sure uh, what I thought, but I had Somebody high who function- bites their nails a lot. That's what I thought. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. But what I had was high functioning anxiety. So that definitely meant that I didn't fit whatever was in my mind or other people's minds either, because I was very functional, right? That's where the high functioning comes in. And from the outside, I looked really calm to people and people used to actually comment quite frequently, oh, you're so calm. And I thought, what are they talking about? Because on the inside, I mean, I was a hot mess. I just, I was, I thought I was just really stressed out all the time. Ah. And so uh, this caused a lot of problems in my life. Um, Number one was anxiety, um, excuse me, insomnia, because my brain was constantly going. So I would always be able to fall asleep. I just couldn't stay asleep in the middle of the night. I would wake up and be up for hours, or I would wake up way earlier than I needed to. Um, And this was perpetual. And it's like, you know, like snap your fingers the moment I woke up my brain was just off and running. Like, what day is it? What do I have to do today? You know, what did I do yesterday? Was there something, you you know, it was just with this crazy conversation in my head. And um, there were two other things I really like to tell people about, because when I do talk about high functioning anxiety, uh, many people don't know that they have it. When I tell them these things that I was suffering, they start to think, oh, that sounds similar to me. And so I would ruminate over past events a lot. Like I would be thinking about things I should have said or could have done or something that somebody else should have done, right? Just replaying it over and over. And I don't mean like, oh, after a conversation for about an hour, I would be replaying it. I mean, sometimes for days, I would do this Mm -hmm. over and over in my head. And then if I wasn't doing that, I was making contingency plans for the future because I was very, very worried about anything that could possibly happen. And I would strategize in my head, right? Like, okay, this thing, this scenario could play out this way. And if it plays out this way, a most likely way that I could react or something I could do is, you know, fill in the blank, but then I'll make another backup plan. Oh gosh. Um, I mean, this is something that, yeah, real life, like real everyday life. If I had to go to, um, let's say an appointment, I had to leave work and this is leave work at a certain time, I would think, okay, well, I know that at that time, traffic on this highway usually is, you know, about like, it'll take me about this long to get there. Mm -hmm. But then I might have trouble parking. So if I'm going to have trouble parking, maybe I should give myself 10 extra minutes. And sometimes you can't go that way. So if I have to get off the highway, what are other ways that I could maybe drive that are like side streets? And I would like, plan multiple routes out in my head you better and not then even go to work you <laughs> stay home yeah and then so i would leave way way too early for sure. all these possible things and then i'd get somewhere like half an hour earlier right because i was like like the the world was going to end on the highway so that's a little example but there usually was much yeah but that's, that's real that's life common yeah yeah of course yeah yeah, that's real life. Um, and so I, I was doing this all of the time. And I guess to cut this story short, because there is a, a happy ending here, is that uh, it took a little bit of time to get there, but I actually wound up getting really sick from a severe autoimmune reaction because I had been pushing my body and my mental body to exhaustion uh, just for so long that my nervous system gave out. And then when that happened, I got sick. 
And that was a real wake up call for me because I finally had to, you know, look at myself and, and realize all the things that I was doing that were not working. Mm. And when I started to try and heal my physical body, I actually got emotional healing that I didn't know that I needed. It was just like this, you know, amazing thing that happened for me. And that's when my life really started to transform. Mm. Mm. What would you say causes anxiety? You know, like how does that, how does that actually work emotionally or physiologically? Yeah. From, you know, from my own journey and from working with so many clients as an anxiety specialist, I feel like there are two main reasons that people have anxiety and that is a lack of acknowledgement of an emotion that we're feeling. And then also not allowing ourselves to process an emotion, meaning just let yourself feel it. So we avoid emotions. We don't want to acknowledge that we're having them like, oh, no, I don't feel that way. Uh, but if we do acknowledge it at all, then we're, there's a fear around, well, what happens if I let myself feel that emotion? And then all sorts of things start to go on in somebody's mind where they're like, well, I can't let myself, you know, feel, feel sad. Let's use that example, because if I feel sad, you know, and then their brain goes to what's going to happen. And so they just shut it off almost like, you know, it's a valve or something and they just turn it off and that doesn't work. <laughs> so what happens is you wind up having anxiety, uh, because your, your body in some way will tell you, well, you actually need to feel that emotion. Wow. Okay. This is a whole new way of processing, of thinking, about anxiety, I, I thought in in preparation for our, our conversation, well, like what? How would I describe anxiety? And I guess I just described it as like a either a like a nervousness about what happened in the past, or a nervousness about what happened is possibly going to happen in the future. Like I, ju I just it was more nebulous, you know what I mean? In my mind, it's like I was thinking about the feelings, but that's so powerful to think about. Okay, this is a feeling that I'm not acknowledging. Or that if I do acknowledge it, I'm just making sure I got this right from you. A feeling that I'm not acknowledging or a, or an emotion that I've acknowledged, but I'm not able to process it or feel it fully. Am I right there? Yes. Yes. That's what I would okay. say. Exactly. Okay. So what happens if we're feeling that pent up emotion inside of us? What happens in our bodies and our brains as we're feeling anxiety? Yeah, this is perfect. I have so many examples, particularly of what happens to our bodies. But I want to start by saying there is a 90 second rule. This is super interesting little fact here. When a person has a reaction to something in their environment, there is a 90 second chemical process that happens in the body. That's it, just 90 seconds. After that, any remaining emotional response is just a person choosing to stay in basically an emotional loop. And so what that means is to our bodies, we do have a chemical reaction. And what I have seen with a lot of people that have anxiety, there is very particular places that they feel it in their body. So your body is a cue. It's a trigger, right? That you're having an emotion that you have to process or that you're feeling anxiety. That's how you know, right? Because you, you can actually feel it just like any other emotion. If I asked you, well, how do you know that you're feeling whatever it is? If you really get, get present, you'll notice, oh, I know that I'm happy because I have like a bubbly sensation in my chest or I just feel like, oh, squee, like, you know, like all this bubbly energy. Well, it's the same thing um, when you're having anxiety. There is body places that let you know, hey, you didn't process an emotion, so now you're feeling the anxiety. The vast majority of the time, people are feeling it in their chest. Mm. That's my experience talking with people. If I ask them, where do you feel your anxiety? They will immediately touch their chest. Other people, if it's not their chest, there's kind of a tie between their throat or their stomach. Those are like the secondary places. And then there's some other ones after that. Like sometimes people will say like their hands are numb or their feet are numb or, um, you know, maybe they get pressure in their head. But it is, it is vast majority of the time um, chest. And I do want to throw in just a, one more statistic and then I'm done with this because this really illustrates this. 
there was a study that was not done very long ago. It was in 2018, and it found that 80% of patients who went to the emergency room with chest pain didn't have a true cardiopulmonary emergency, meaning like heart or lung, right? So it was the majority of the time, 58%, it was their anxiety that was causing chest pain, and they thought, I'm having a heart attack. And that has happened for a couple of my clients. They have gone to the ER and I'm talking one of them's 30, right? Totally great health. She went to the ER because her chest hurt so bad. So this is what's happening to her body, like an extreme physical response a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, okay, after the 90 seconds, then if we're still feeling something like that, you're saying that we're choosing to stay in an emotional loop, I believe is what you called it. Right. Why do we choose to stay in that loop if we would rather not feel those things? You know what I mean? Why would? Yeah, and that's that right. And that's, yeah, I know it seems that sounds almost slightly counterintuitive, but it is because we're not acknowledging the emotion, as I said, or allowing ourselves to process it. So we had like that chemical response your body's like, Hey, you're feeling this thing. You really need to feel it. And then it's too scary. So we stop it. We stop acknowledging, we don't process it. And then we just stay in this loop. And then there we are stuck. Mm -hmm. So when I think about anxiety, I think about, um, people not wanting to speak in front of others. I think about people who maybe don't want to go into an atmosphere with people that uh, they don't know. Um, I think about doing something that's maybe risky or dangerous, but really when you're talking about anxiety, it could be anything that someone could feel anxiety about because of either not being tapped into that emotion or not being willing to experience it. Am I right there? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what you said, like as an example, um, I have never had much fear about public speaking, but I had, you know, I had (laughs) massive high functioning anxiety. And so this is where, uh, you know, the concept of anxiety triggers comes in because everyone is very, very unique. And what is causing an individual to feel something that they are, you know, repressing or avoiding is, yeah, it's so individual. And what it is for one person may not be the case for others at all. And I'd like, I'm an extrovert. And maybe that's why when you said, you know, speaking in front of people or, you know, large groups of people, that for me has never been a fear. I do know people, of course, who have social anxiety and are introverts. And yeah, that they don't want to do those things that you just mentioned at all. Sure. Fascinating. So um, you talk about this phrase, two words together that I've never heard before until I started interacting with you. And it's called emotional willingness, emotional willingness. And you even have a free download on your website of helping, you know, a person look at their emotional willingness. What does that Mm -hmm. term mean? And how does that, how does that impact our anxiety? Right. So emotional willingness, just if, if someone is, has high emotional willingness, then they have the ability to recognize that they are feeling an emotion and they're willing to show it to other people. And so if someone is not emotionally willing, then that means they're not recognizing it. They're not willing to process it. And they certainly don't want any other people to know that they're feeling what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And so people who are listening right now might wonder, well, am I emotionally willing? I'm not sure. Um, So these are some questions, right, that you could ask yourself. Uh, Do you try to hide how you feel from other people? I don't feel Uh, comfortable answering that question. (laughs) Do you avoid crying in front of other people? I certainly did. I mean, I can tell you when I had a corporate job, there was one day I was having a bad day and I just went into a bathroom stall and cried. I never, Mm. ever would have let anybody see that happen. Mm -hmm. And even as another personal example, my mom was uh, diagnosed with cancer and I was telling my boss and because I didn't, you know, I didn't know if I was going to have to be out of work. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. Plus, I also wanted to know I'm a bit preoccupied, you know, right now. And I remember I was telling him and we were, it was just one-on-one in a meeting room and I started crying and I was so embarrassed that I was crying in front of him and I apologized for it. And I look back and I think, 
why would I apologize about crying when my right. mom had cancer? Well, it's because at that point in my life, I was had like, you know, no emotional <laughs> willingness. So these are just some questions for people to think about. And also, you know, there's this concept, I really, I feel like we're finally breaking this down, at least in American society, but it's still there. It's like, I have to be strong, right? Like if you show emotions to other people, it means you're weak Mm -hmm. and we don't want to be weak. So we have to be strong all the time. And so that means, well, don't show anybody your emotions, right? And mm-hmm. that's what I was just talking about with, you know, apologizing to my boss when I was crying when my mom had cancer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Emotional willingness. I think there are probably some wives listening right now that are going to go home and say, honey, you're just not emotionally willing. <laughs> Right. Right. But, you know, I think this happens even with, I think that's a great example because I think this also even happens with moms sometimes because, you know, I'm a mom and uh, it's like that concept of being strong. We don't want to, you know, quote unquote, scare our kids. And so we think, oh, well, I just won't let my kids see that I'm feeling this right now because I don't want to alarm them. I don't want to worry them. Yeah. And so then we repress it and, and shove it down. And that's the opposite of what we should be doing. We definitely should be modeling like, hey, we have emotions and they're going to come out when they come out hmm. and it's okay to express them. Mm-hmm. So um, how, how does someone, is, is a lack of emotional willingness, nature, nurture, combination? Like if I grew up in a home... I'm not saying I did, but some people grew up in a home and maybe emotions were not acceptable or only certain emotions were acceptable. Like, does that play into it? How, how, how does somebody, you know, come to a place where they're not emotionally willing? I do think the vast majority of the time it is upbringing, it is per- parents or other guardians, but this is societal as well because if you think back to school, right, there are teachers who are not comfortable with emotions. There's other kids that might make fun of another kid if he or she is crying. So it's, it's probably in a lot of media to the point that we just don't even notice it anymore. I, mm-hmm. think, I think the most impactful is your home life and upbringing, but there are other factors that are contributors. Mm-hmm. So you're saying I need to identify my emotions and express my emotions in order to alleviate anxiety. Is that the number one way you would say to alleviate anxiety? Yes. The clients that I've worked with, we start at some very fundamental foundational things. Uh, That is even including having an emotional vocabulary because sometimes it's just really even difficult to describe how you're feeling Mm -hmm. and emotions have nuances, right? There's a difference between anger and being irate or being miffed, right? There's a spectrum there. And so uh, to know how you're feeling, sometimes you do have to have the word and it's not always necessary, but I mean, Mm -hmm. that's helpful. And then it is the acknowledgement of this thing just happened, whatever the trigger was or the situation And it's making me feel this. So acknowledging it and then actually letting your body feel it like that 90 second rule that I was talking about. It's, it's sitting there, it's taking a pause and saying, okay, I'm feeling sad right now. I'm feeling angry. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to let myself feel it. Mm -hmm. And that might mean, oh my gosh, your, you know, throat is going to clench up a bit or your face is going to get hot or you're going to cry, but then you just let yourself feel it. And then it is gone (laughs) because of the 90 second rule. And I mean, this took a lot of, you know, practice for me. And now I'm to the point where I can feel something and it is so fast. I mean, it's just like, I, I, oh, I need to feel this. And then I just feel it. And then boom, maybe 10 or 15 seconds, it's gone. Mm. But yeah, it, it takes some work and commitment Mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, do this process. Mm -hmm. I would think if you would have asked me prior to our conversation, how do you deal with anxiety? Well, uh, maybe, you know, you need to set better boundaries in your life. Maybe you need to focus on some breathing techniques or meditation or um, taking walks in nature or, you know what I mean? Like, man, I'm way off. 
Jeez. Well, I would say those things are true, right? And those are in some ways stress relief. And I am a big exerciser. Um, and that for me, it is how I just, it is part of how I process the emotion. That's the thing. It's like, I'm very kinesthetic. So you're right in, in some ways. And there is all of those things that you mentioned are useful because if someone is the type of person who doesn't set boundaries, there are reasons for that. There are reasons why they let people take, let's say, maybe advantage of them. And those things do need to be addressed because there's triggers in there. I mean, this is pretty complex. <laughs> so, so you're right. But, but the fundamental thing that needs to happen is what I said. All of those sort of things that you were talking about, I kind of think as layers on top mm -hmm. of the real, like the real actual work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. My wife is a kindergarten teacher, as our listeners know, and she will have the kids oftentimes point at a piece of paper that has different faces and different words mm -hmm. on it to describe their emotions because she's trying to help them articulate those rather than moving toward lashing out, crying, curling up underneath their desk. You know, So she's trying to begin from a very early age, helping them identify their emotions. Um, you mentioned that we needed a an emotion vocabulary, um, would you say that's a good first step for someone who's trying to become emotionally willing? Like what else beyond, maybe we need I to do get a think the maybe we should have a download <laughs> yeah. on this episode. I, yeah, I do think the vocabulary sheet is very useful and um, that that is easy to find if anyone wants to look this up. You just you know type emotional vocabulary chart into Google and you'll get tons of them. And I love what your uh, wife is doing because that's, that is the core thing. This is how we raise kids to understand this is how I'm feeling. And I'm trying to think back to kindergarten or first grade. Did I ever see that? I don't think I did. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like the getting the emotional vocabulary, some people who are listening may actually already feel like they have that. That's mm -hmm. not their first step. Sure. But if someone is thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know if I have the words to describe it, that is their first step. And then the, if, if somebody is past that point, then I would say that they are ready to probably take the next step, which is much more um, questioning of the self, like some, some very specific questions that I'm going to say now. What emotion am I feeling right now? Uh, what emotion made me feel, no, excuse me, what happened that made me feel that way? Mm -hmm. Um, and then where am I feeling this emotion in my body? And then one can breathe into that spot in their body, like the, you know, chest example that I gave. So they've realized, oh my gosh, I am incredibly, let's just say they're very mad and they're feeling it in their chest. They can say, I'm allowing that anger to move through me. And they just focus on their chest and breathe and just, you know, you're acknowledging what the the emotion is, you've named it, you're acknowledging that you're having it, you're recognizing where it is in your body, and then you're allowing yourself to feel it. And that sounds really simple. And it actually is that simple. <laughs> but we have to be at the point where we can say, Oh, wait a minute, I'm feeling something. What is it that I'm feeling? And if somebody doesn't can't get to that point, well, then yeah, they have to start with the vocabulary. And I would even add to that, that all of what you just described is best to do before responding to whatever just happened. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. <Right? laughs> Ideally. Yeah. yeah. Versus the shutdown, run, hit, walk away, you know, anger, outburst. It's like, oh, I'm feeling this. I got I to gotta process this for a minute before I respond. Because um, otherwise the response is probably going to be out purely out of that emotion rather than yeah. processing what's going on. Yeah. A lot of people may be listening to this. Um, if you work in a corp, a corporate job before you send that email, <laughs> if you know you're yes. upset, take a, take a few minutes and just do the little process that, um, that I said. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, beyond what you're describing to us, what are the products or services or resources that you provide, um, to your clients that might be helpful to someone who's listening that goes, Okay, I get the I get the idea of what you're talking about, but I feel a little overwhelmed. I need some help. 
Right. So, I mean, I definitely would love for people to get their hands on that emotional willingness download. There is a really helpful rating scale in that that will let someone know how willing they are. And it has some very intentional journaling exercises to provide clarity about why or why not (laughs) one is emotionally willing. Uh, On my website, I also have some guided meditations, one of which is free. Uh, Guided meditation is a great way for people to start meditating who don't meditate because it is a very good way to calm yourself. And I will say for most people, if you have not meditated before and you just sit down, you know, and close your eyes and cross your legs, it's really hard. And so a great way to get started is through a guided meditation and to know that you'd only have to do it for a few minutes. This does not need to be you sitting down, you know, in some lotus pose that you've seen online for half an hour, because that's probably not going to happen. Um, And aside from those free resources, of course, I work with individuals one-on-one and I offer group programs as well. Awesome. Now, the name of your website, uh, which we obviously will link to in the show notes is theenergysynergist.com. And you uh, provide uh, Reiki and energy healing. Now you didn't mention this. So how does that, what is that? And how does that tie into helping people with their anxiety? Yeah, that's a pretty big conversation, but yeah, one of the tools that I use to help my clients with their anxiety is energy work. And, uh, Reiki is an energy healing modality. And when I say that, sometimes people are like, well, you just spoke Uh, another language. (laughs) What? And so, um, the best way to just think of this is we are energetic beings. We are really just a bunch of atoms bouncing around if you want to get down to the the core level of it. And so in our um, energetic bodies, in our energetic systems, we store past experiences and past traumas. And I've already mentioned that, like our upbringing, right? A lot of the time has really shaped who we are. And so we all have significant events and experiences that have shaped us. And quite often we energetically and emotionally store those. They are, the analogy I use is they're like little computer programs that are running in the background and they dictate our behavior and our outcomes. And so energy work is an amazing way to basically remove those energetic blocks to kind of rewrite the program uh, so that it is no longer there and it's no longer running the show. And when those past experiences aren't influencing us any longer, that's when really big change can start to occur Mm -hmm. because we're not, yeah, those things aren't dictating our Mm -hmm. reality. We're able to form and create a new reality for ourselves. Are you doing this by touching me or are you like doing this via Zoom or like, how does this work? Is the energy flowing through the screen here, Heather? What's going on? I know this is, I know this is a little abstract probably for people who haven't heard of this before. I do see um, people in person if they happen to live in Austin where I live. I don't actually touch people. I just hover my hands over them. But if I'm working with clients who don't live in Austin, I just meet with them over Zoom and I connect to people's energy that way. And this is, I mean, this is a mind bender, but we can connect to anyone's energy anywhere because we are energetic beings. And that really kind of is across time and space. So let's just keep it simple. (laughs) And let's just say it's pretty cool and it works no matter where you are. That's amazing. Are you sending me energy right now? Because I'm feeling like that. (laughs) I wish people could um, see because we are recording this uh, podcast and we can see each other and uh, David's (laughs) making some some amazing faces. Well, I'm sending you good vibes because I love chatting with you. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) It's all good energy. Good, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I have uh, definitely, you know, spoken with other people that that utilize that modality. Now, did you, have you sensed from when you were, you know, at a certain age that you had, is that a gift or is it something you could learn or, you know what I mean? Like, how did you start pushing your energy around? Like, when did that start happening? Yeah, that started during that process of healing that I, you know, mentioned at the very beginning of us chatting. Uh, I, 
did not grow up spiritual at all. I did not, this wasn't a thing that I possessed. I took classes. You can, you take actual classes from other energy healers. And when you want to start doing energy work, there is a process that's called an attunement. And it means that you're basically opened up to be a channel for the energy to flow through you. And so Reiki, as I said, is one energy healing modality. I actually use other ones as well. So I have um, a number of modalities that I use in my work. Wow. The energy synergist.com. I feel like I'm talking to like a wizard or something. Like you're like a magic person. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I know other magic people, but uh, it always amazes me when I talk to a magic person. Uh, One of my really good friends, her name's Stacy, and she's, you know, she doesn't do energy healing, but she, you know, she sees things ahead of time. You know, she knows things that are going to happen, which just freaks me out all the time. I'm like, she's like, I had a dream about you last night. I'm like, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. Don't tell me about your dream. What if, what if she's going to tell you something amazing? Well, yeah, that could, I could understand how maybe you wouldn't want to know because then it maybe would, um, not if it's even positive or negative, it's just might influence your behavior, right? Because then you feel like, well, you already told me what's going to happen now. Now the fun is gone. I don't want to know. I want to be surprised. I, and that's what I kind of make it sound more spiritual. I go, Hey, I just want to be in tune with the energetic spirits. You know, I don't want to have to like be, you know, trying to guide a situation and she rolls her eyes and then we keep going with the conversation. <laughs> She sounds fun. I like to uh, joke with her a lot. Um, Heather, thank you. This is so good. Oh, one last thing that I wanted people to know about, and we'll link to this in the show notes as well, is you have a summit that's coming up that um, I had the privilege of participating in, and I want people to know about this. And um, they may not be able to sign up yet. I don't know if the link will be ready, but I at least we want people to hear about it. And of course, they'll be able to go to your website and learn some more at some point. Yes, I was so excited to have you as a guest. It's called Mastering Your Mindset, Living a Life of Joy. And I have brought together mindset experts from all over the world who are sharing actionable advice and techniques that people can implement in their life like immediately so that they can start feeling more joy and more ease. That was my goal is to bring together experts who could share actionable tools because that's what I'm all about. It's like, I want to help people. And I wanted my experts to, you know, impart wisdom for other people to get actionable techniques. So we have you, we have many amazing uh, experts from all over uh, the world. So I hope that people who are listening will be able to join the summit. And of course, see my interview of you, David. And what are the dates on that? So it is, oh my gosh, It is running from October the 19th. Yes, October the 19th to November the 2nd. Great, 2020. And so do we have a a URL for it yet or should we just point people toward your website? Um, I think that the website, my website might be um, the best. I'm not sure when this um, podcast is going to go live. There is a website just for the summit. It is um, Mastering Your Mindset for Joy. But definitely my website will have information when it's ready. And as you already mentioned, that's theenergysynergist.com. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. I appreciate being with you. Thank you. I loved this conversation. It was amazing.